Welcome back to Theme Park Wizard. In today's video, we have special guest Theme Park Casual and super special guest WDW Pro for the first time ever on Theme Park Wizard to talk about D23 and Splash Mountain. At this time of this, this goes up, D23 Park Spin will be tomorrow. So, super exciting stuff. Welcome, WDW Pro, to the channel. Thank you so much for coming on. For the first time, I know you're a very busy guy and busy group you got going with the park place. So thank you very much. Well, it's fantastic to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hope we can deliver based on the accolades you've given. So we'll have to rise up to that level that you have uh, esteemed me to. So thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. And welcome back, Casual, for, I believe, what, the third time now? You're like, like a superstar guest on here. Where can everyone find you? Yeah, thanks for having me back. You can find me on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram at Theme Park Casual. And you can find WDW Pro on The Park Place 1 on Twitter and theparkplace.com. Dot com, right? Yeah, dot com. On, Very close. Uh, so we actually, we're tricky with our with our articles. So it's thatparkplace.com. That park place. If you go to theparkplace.com, we cannot guarantee the type of content you will receive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Don't go to the, uh, you know, I'll just link it in the comments below, but not the, but that. Um, and Google or Firefox or whatever you use. So today we're going to talk about Splash Mountain. Will it stay? Will it go? What's happening? Should it stay? Should it go? D23. What could be announced? What couldn't be announced? Will be an overwhelmed or disappointed? So, starting with WDW Pro, Splash Mountain. Do you think it should stay? Should it go? Does it make any sense? Does it make doesn't make any sense? Things a waste of money. What are your thoughts? So, in reality, Splash Mountain for the domestic parks is certainly on the way out. There is no way that they are going to walk back from where they have ventured when it comes to replacing Splash Mountain with, uh, with the uh, Bayou Adventure. Now, as to whether or not they should do that, um, let's just stick with the raw data for now. Mm -hmm. uh, over the last month, we have been keeping an, keeping an eye on the queue times, the wait times for attractions at both Disneyland and at Walt Disney World. Mm -hmm. And for both coasts, Splash Mountain is consistently at the very top in either the first, second, or third place for longest queue times. Now, the reason that that is of particular interest is because not only is Splash Mountain generating long wait times on both coasts, which you might not expect. You might consider that it would be more popular in Florida, considering that the stories on which it is based are out of Georgia, which is adjacent to Florida. And you might think that the current uh, political climate in California would mean that Splash Mountain would be less popular there. But that doesn't seem to be true necessarily based on the, the length of time people are willing to wait. But it's particularly interesting because Splash Mountain has a very high uh, capacity. And so it can run guests through at a, a very high rate compared to most attractions. It also is usually up and running. It doesn't have downtime. So for example, when you look at Rise of the Resistance and you see that it has a long wait time, you also have to factor in that that attraction over a, a one month period, let's say, has a far higher amount of downtime where it's being worked on and having to be rebooted and that sort of thing. Um, so Splash Mountain is clearly popular. Whatever the, the headwinds may be in regards to the context surrounding the attraction, the population at large enjoys the attraction. And I think if Disney had to do it over, and specifically Bob Chapek, if he had to do it over, because he wasn't in full control at the point that this decision was made. In fact, I don't think he was at all in control uh, given the way this occurred. And we'll, we'll leave that for another time. But um, I think if he had a, a redo, he probably would also agree that it would have been better to have Tiana receive her own attraction and have that be something spectacular and not take down Splash Mountain. I think that the company at large has really put itself in a difficult position regarding Song of the South and Splash Mountain. Um, 
we've had on that part place the daughter of Nick Stewart. Now, Nick Stewart was the original voice actor for Br'er Bear. And he, along with other trailblazers, were part of that initial push in that movie to make sure that African Americans were represented on the big screen. That wasn't difficult, or that was, it was very difficult to do at the time. And so we should really spend time uh, being grateful and honoring their legacy. And it seems like in this push to uh, wipe the slate clean of that movie and of this attraction, we're forgetting about the trailblazers who maybe they didn't create something that is perfect or pristine in today's worldview, but at the same time, they made great strides forward for all of the rest of us so that we can enjoy diversity in the media that we, that we love. See, and that's very interesting because I actually obviously did not know that. Um, so that's very uh, interesting to know. And yeah, people just don't really realize that because yeah, African-Americans or any minorities, well, it was hard to get a role, especially at that time uh, in any movie. So that is really a pretty, it is trailblazing. And I was looking at the wait times while you're talking about them. Splash Mountain at this second, 5.50 p.m. September 7th, has 45-minute wait, which is up there with uh, right now with the rest of the Disneyland attractions and about the major ones at 45-minute waits. The only higher ones like Indiana Jones at 50 minutes, so still popular even uh, right now currently. It's like 103 outside, but still very popular. What do you think about that, Casual? Yeah, it's, it's like I've always said. Nobody is avoiding the attraction based on the theme. And nobody is going to avoid the new attraction based on the theme. So it, it's it's really kind of odd why they're spending this kind of money to retheme something that is still popular. When, you know, especially in Florida, there's capacity issues at Magic Kingdom. So why would you take a high capacity, very popular attraction offline spend probably hundreds of millions to retheme it get it up to speed for today's standards with today's technology and then you're not adding any capacity when it comes back online when like pro said tiana is definitely deserving of her own amazing attraction when you could do that and add capacity and especially when you look at it with Splash Mountain, with a height restriction, how many little girls and boys that want to ride it because Tiana is their favorite princess are not going to be able to now? It seems like a very bad move to put something like that with a height requirement as a restriction for a lot of these little ones who would love to go and ride Tiana's ride. And not even just the height requirement, but uh, yeah, if someone is tall enough but just doesn't like big drops, you know, and they... You know, they want to see Tiana, but they just, they cannot, they will not go and note the big drop at the end, uh, then they can't. No. And again, as you mentioned, Florida, not only for capacity, but it's right in the middle of Frontierland uh, where they don't have New Orleans Square. So it'd be even more money if they want to do it right. So we theme it in Florida so because they hopefully want to match the surrounding area, at least some of it, to a bayou instead of a frontier rock uh so that's more money over there i still think yes tiana should get her own nice boat attraction for everyone with e-ticket animatronics almost like a larger navi river adventure journey or something i don't know like that way everybody can go on a massive impressive tiana and naveen animatronic and replace winnie the pooh or something with that and then it'll be perfect um in my opinion but uh Obviously, that doesn't seem the route they're going with, uh, Mr. Pro, correct? We know one of the funny things about what they are attempting is, first of all, this has never been done before. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are in unprecedented waters in that they are taking an attraction which is consistently one of their most popular, and they are going to gut that attraction. Now, they may feel that the reason they're doing so is worthwhile, but Again, it's never been done before where you take one of the most popular attractions that you have and you essentially condemn it and replace it with something new with the belief that you can either replicate or outperform the genius that you have. And it must be genius because somebody might listen to that and think, well, 
it's not genius. It's, it's flawed and it's terrible and whatever you might come up with for reasons to think that. But you have to consider also that that attraction, even until this day, as they're preparing to close it, is incredibly popular. People are lining up for this thing. People are waiting uh, in the heat, in the sun. People want to ride this. And that means there's something to it. And so if you're into theme parks, if you're into understanding what, what makes them uh, tick, then you need to sit down and you need to consider, okay, what is it about this attraction that has people coming? And it's not a given that you can take that and that you can completely swap the theme out and that you come out with something that is still distilled into that same level of joy to guess. There's no guarantee here. And so you could potentially run into a situation where you have uh, another journey into imagination scenario where in that case, it wasn't as popular, uh, nowhere even close, but mm -hmm. they took an attraction that was somewhat popular in Epcot and they attempted to modify that to be better and, and they failed. And for 20 years now, um, Epcot in that section of the park has been essentially wiped out. I mean, people just don't go there very much. In fact, more people probably go to that area of the park to go watch Pixar shorts, which really tells you something considering they're available on Disney plus. The other thing I would say is that the, the people who are over this particular project of doing the Bayou adventure, they seem to be drawn to the idea whether or not this is, uh, some sort of facade they're giving. They seem to be drawn to the idea of being highly authentic to New Orleans and to Southern Louisiana, and that's fine. Except you you come into severe conflict because there are no elevated terrains in Southern Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to such a, a degree to try to, to meld this concept together because this, this mountain idea is foreign to Louisiana. There are no mountains there. And so what they're doing is they actually took a trip to uh, a salt flat that has some degree of elevation. It's on Avery Island in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so they went to this area where they mine salt and they're actually considering or have considered and are incorporating, but they're actually working on having that salt uh, dome, that salt dome idea brought in to explain why there is some sort of mountain in Louisiana for this attraction. The problem with that is I've, I've talked to native uh what would you say, Louisianians? I'm not sure how you say mm -hmm. that one. But um, people native to Louisiana, and they kind of laugh about it. And they say, you got to be kidding. That thing's like, uh, what, you know, 15 feet elevation, 20 feet elevation? So but they've really got themselves in a bind. And if they could execute at the very highest level, and perhaps they will, we'll see what, what they're doing at D23. I think we'll get uh, some ride-through CGI stuff. We'll see what the concept looks like. But if they don't perform at the very highest level, they put themselves in, in a bad situation of their own doing where they've sabotaged Tiana as a property. And they've also sabotaged their, their guests because inevitably what will happen is that if the new attraction fails to rise to the amount of, of joy bringing uh, that Splash Mountain does, for, for lack of a better way of putting that, if it fails to obtain that level of joy bringing that it gives to all those families, then we're going to see those articles that talk about racism and all those horrible things and, and that will uh, sort of paint broadly over guests who don't like the new Tiana ride. And there's no good in that. There's no good in putting guests and putting fans in a position where if you don't like something, you're treated in a negative light. And so all of this is just messy. And a question, because you said the mouth of salt, so uh, from what I remember, and I've seen the movie a couple of times, they don't talk about any salt domes at all. So how would they work that even into the right, like the movie or the, you know, the movie's plot? Because they, like, I don't remember them talking, and Tiana never talks about any salt domes or anything. Well, well I so believe. Bit, yeah, go ahead. I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I believe that they're not even taking the movie story this is oh yeah a know, story like that happens happened. post movie yeah well, so there's going to be know. a lot of people that are looking for facilier and friends yeah. on the other side and probably going to be sure. like like we said disappointed sure they'll get that in there some way maybe <laughs> yeah but if, if, if they have any wisdom they will do that. they'll do that yeah yeah there's they that better. i better hear it going up the lift too <laughs> 
but like really are you know they're gonna work the salt dome to the universe i don't know i i feel like that's another thing it's uh you know ha- pl- taking place after the, the movie and with original they say original songs see that scares me a little bit because i really like the the, oh, the songs good. of the movie so uh like i don't know what for bad songs you know, at least make it about the movie if you're gonna change it because one thing i really like about splash Mountain is the songs i love those songs i have the playlist on my phone i hope they don't take it away from me because they can just do that but i have it on my phone so i hope i was hoping to hear some nice princess and the frog songs but i really hope the original music isn't terrible and i still don't see the need for original music when there's a whole great soundtrack of princess and the frog songs right here well, you do know, you have when any you, uh, when you had that feeling when you had that feeling inside you that said huh that was called common sense and uh, it's uh-huh. lacking in some of these people because anybody with any level of common sense would look at if they were tasked let's say let's say that you are working in imagineering at WDI, and an executive comes to you and says, we're going to replace Splash Mountain, and we want you to be in charge, or we want you to be a part of the project. Well, one, you should be very nervous about that, because that's a, that's a make or break. And then two, the, the when someone says, we're not going to go with beloved music that we currently have, we're going to make our own, that would be the time that you really start to sweat, because the chances that you can replicate the soundtrack from Princess and the Frog... And the, or that you can exceed it. Well, that's already low. The chance that you can outdo Zippity Doodah, which is an Oscar-winning song sung by the first African-American male to ever win an Oscar, the idea that you're going to beat that is also exceedingly low. So you've been put in a no-win situation unless you just strike lightning on several occasions. Which is very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need an umbrella. <laughs> What do you think about that casual, the music choice? Yeah, I, I don't know how you're going to top zippity doo I mean, that is a Disney anthem. I mean, that's got to be, if not top three, at least top five all-time Disney songs. It's irrelevant and, now. Yeah, that's... <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's, it's so crazy to think that. It, it's it's just nuts. Now, I, I have a question for you, Pro. Um, when it comes to the actual ride system do you feel that there's any chance that they can actually change the layout of the flume or is that basically set in stone there's no way to move it um is that well, way more work than a, they want there's well, always it, a way but, but do you think they, they would go through that expense no, yeah no i don't think so um what i've heard is that the budget is about 200 million dollars for this uh this project and I think a lot I of that. I feel like that's a little go. low. It is. It is. It is quite low. You have to remember that this project was lined up during the pandemic when they had great uncertainty, <laughs> and so that budget was likely set based on not knowing which way this could go as far as attendance post pandemic, and so they were probably a little adverse to to taking a, a a big gamble on this. You also have to think that if they put forward a huge budget and they want to change the layout, let's say, or they want to change the lift hill in some way, if they do that, that money does not go to any of these other big projects they want to do. So whether that was the Epcot uh, redo that has largely been scrapped now or whether that was Disneyland Forward, whatever the case may be, if they put that budget into Splash Mountain, which they're going to rename, it's still going into an existing ride. They're just reskinning it and they're just putting new music on it. There's nothing that's happening here that is going to drive new people or or a mass rush to the park. So why would you spend a huge budget on it? It's not going to be like what they had expected would happen with uh, with with uh, Galaxy's Edge. It's not like what did happen with Pandora. This is going to draw the same fans who are already going. Mm-hmm. And so, will there be? Or do you know potentially if there be more or less the same animatronics? We're using the same animatronics. I know there's be like a Tiana one, but like in terms of all the critters, will they just take them all out, or will they reuse some? Um, will there be fewer or more the same? 
I hope that well, they're going the to same, reskin. You know? They're going to reskin as much as they can, and mm -hmm. then they have spent a large portion of the budget on um, next level uh, animatronics for Tiana, and so those are already. My understanding is those are already uh, produced and ready to go. And I think that they are based off of the animatronic uh, bell that's featured in Disneyland Paris. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, I just hope and there's not going to be any other. Will there be any screens or no screens? Um, I would I would expect screens. Let's just say that. Oh, no. But, you know, that's not necessarily bad. Um, Unless they're like, I'm not saying it's going to be completely screen-based. Like projections type or... I don't, I'm trying to imagine the screen. I just don't want to see like a big TV in there. As long as that's no, I think, that. No, I, I would be doubtful of that except in possibly in the queue. Oh, okay. Okay. Like, so... Projections, I guess the projections aren't like yes, too bad. I, would, like, I, would I can like projections are on the way. Yeah, I don't like, think you're going to get um, uh, what is it? The Navi, what, what's the name? It, it escaped him right now. The uh, Navi River Journey. That's right. I, I don't think yeah. you're going to have anything, anything like that, where almost all of the effects are driven by screens or by CGI. Like I can understand projections for like the fireflies. I can see that. I, I feel like that like might look nice, but. You know, oh, I just hope it's good. I hope it's good, Casual and Pro. I hope it's good. Well, you have to think, though, that if they do a lot of the screen stuff, so this is one thing that might make you feel a little better. If they do a lot of the screen stuff, because of the source material, that's going to have to be hand-drawn. And hand-drawn oh, animation yeah, is nice. very expensive. And it's rising in expense every day because the number of people who can do that are less and less. That is true. That is true. Hand John animation. Oh, yeah. As long as they make it look good. Oh boy, as long as they make it look good. Yeah. Nervous. That's that's gonna be the key. Now a question about the budget. Um, if it's roughly two hundred million, that's to get both of them done, correct? Well, that's been left ambiguous to me, but I am assuming wholeheartedly that it's for uh that both of them have two hundred million dollar budgets. I do not oh, think well, that, okay. that okay. combined. Yeah. I was if say, they are if combined, was... then oh my gosh, that's that's right. That's what that's what I was. Yeah. That's why I was <laughs> trying to find out. <laughs> if they're combined, think, then so a, lot that's people, game a lot of people might not consider this. But how much of the budget is going to go into removing all of the stuff that's in there right now that has to be mm -hmm. replaced? Um, you're talking about a lot of stuff that has to be uh, demoed in a way that you can quickly then come in and start putting in new items and the amount of wiring that is going to be involved in this is just mm -hmm. uh, and then the number of specialists who are going to have to come into this attraction which was never meant to go through something of this uh, magnitude so it, it wasn't designed to be swapped out let's say right and then california also has to deal with all their um, osha restrictions and, and guidelines and requirements so there's a lot of retrofitting that's going to be happening inside the california one in addition to just standard demo and refurb sure and on the legal mm -hmm. side of that anything that was grandfathered in will no longer be so yeah and because of that because now there's a lot of things grandfathered in will they have to and obviously they might have the profit to take it away, but will the space look, I don't know, more empty because of that? Do you think? Like the inside I mean, the show that, building? That will depend on the skills of the Imagineers and the team that has been assigned to this project. I would, I mean, I would be doubtful that it will look empty. I hope it won't look empty. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling for this to be as good as it can be because we're stuck with it for two mm -hmm. decades, probably. Whatever it is, so let's hope that it's as good as it can possibly be. And also, we don't want to be in a situation where guests are complaining and access media is calling them all sorts of isms. That would be, uh, that would be less than optimal. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, I think the dogs agree, by the way. Yeah, yeah I think dog, so. The dog is not happy. He, he's, he's, like, he's, he's, like, <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. I'm nervous. That's a nervous bark. I heard it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> so you think we'll see some ride through video potentially, or like some you know animated ride through video on uh, 
this weekend? Well, everything can change, and it has not occurred yet, so we're not in the present yet on that. But mm -hmm. my understanding is that they do have ride-through video, and I think that uh, I think that D23 is as good a time as any to show that. At the very least, we're going to get a lot of concept art. One interesting thing about that is for a long time now, we have had, what, two pieces of concept? Mm -hmm. And that's an odd thing when we have been told repeatedly by uh, the quote-unquote experts that this has been something they've been developing for half a decade and that they brought this out when they did only because it was time and they weren't pressured by any other uh, external forces. Uh -huh. That's an odd thing to only see two pieces of concept art thus far. And also what I'm going to be looking for, and I hope you guys are as well, let's watch and see if aspects of the original concept art have been modified now. Because if we see oh, that, yeah. if, we see, if we see changes, we're going to know that that original concept art was likely blue sky documents that they pulled out in, in a haste. And uh, I'll go on a ledge right now and say that I think that we received some blue sky concept art originally in 2020 because Disney was worried that Disney Plus could face a boycott by uh, certain uh, groups or demographics or what have you. And so I think that Disney rushed out blue sky content and then decided that they would fill in the gaps later on. Hmm. You know, that I, I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, it's not, it's pretty rare for Disney to do two pieces of concept art, like one, but then several months of gap, then another one, then several months of nothing. You know, it's very, very strange how that rolled out there and coincidentally right in the middle of a of a time when it seemed then it would it would be most appropriate that we get those two pieces of concept art or one or oh, one to two pieces of concept art. Very, very interesting. You now I had a question. Disney Disney is not necessarily the most virtuous company in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean we cover them quite a bit, but uh they have done things in the past that are scurrilous to say the least. For example, when they uh, thanked the government of China after filming Mulan next to concentration camps. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, I mean, that's just ridiculously bad and we should condemn mm -hmm. that. But uh, Disney is seeking that bottom line. And that's not to say that everybody who works at Disney is bad or that they have ill content or that they are uh, out to make bad decisions. It's just to say that as a corporation, sometimes they make decisions that are strictly financial and lacking in ethics or moral judgment. And so when we look back at 2020 and the tumultuous time we had, it's worth giving some thought to the idea that perhaps Disney was willing to do almost anything to protect Disney Plus. Today, Disney Plus is a formidable uh, opponent to Netflix. But at the time, they were definitely not the competitor that they are, and they probably would do almost anything to protect Disney Plus, considering the impact it has on their stock value. And <laughs> to even go further, consider that at that time, with the pandemic beginning, Disney Plus was one of the only components of uh, the Walt Disney Company that was able to function. And so mm -hmm. it may have been that they were willing to do anything while their cruise ships were docked, while their parks were closed, to keep people happy with Disney Plus. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, and yeah, it was the only really real revenue stream at that point. Uh, very, very interesting. And as we switch over here to my D23, it's obviously coming up. This parks panel would be tomorrow from when this airs, but a few days from now from recording. What do you hear? Rumored may be announced, may not be announced. Are we going to be disappointed or overwhelmed or overjoyed? Which one? Which one do you think? Well, I'm interested in hearing what Casual has to say about this question to start off with, and then I'll, I'll yes. piggyback on that. Well, I'm, I'm optimistic. Let's put it that way. I'm hoping that some of these rumors that we've been hearing, you know, something, you know, things like the people mover coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm really hoping for stuff like that. And um, 
the fact that the DVC lounge got announced for the current launch bay building um, gives a little bit of, you know, a little bit of life to that rumor as well, because you can have the people mover cruise right by and let everybody see, look what, look what you get if you're a DVC member. But, um, Excellent point, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, um, was it just yesterday? I think it was that the OC vibe um, got their funding or the green light of some sort. Yeah, yeah, their approval. Yeah, from the yeah. City of so, Anna. so they've got their little entertainment district over near the and Honda that's what, Center. Like Four billion dollars or something like that. Yeah. So, so that kind of starts putting a, a, a little bit of a spotlight on Disneyland forward, and you know that they, they could get all of their. Um, zoning requests approved. And we all know that, you know, coming 2028, we've got the Olympics coming to LA. So Anaheim could say, you know what, we want to put on our, our, our best, best outfit, our Sunday best, as you, as you may say, but I'm, I'm hoping that we get a lot of these rumors to be true. What, what they are, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have any connections behind the scenes or anything. So I'm going off of just what I'm hearing online. So uh, I, my, my big thing would be, I want the people mover back. That, that would be my, that would be enough for me to be, okay. It was a win for, for the Disneyland side. And the DVC lounge is, you know, the casual is there, but also looks, you know, very, temporary in nature so uh, the way it, the concept art is so that is also a plus for it not being there for like 80 years so that's good True. what do True. you think about the uh casual you want the avengers e ticket that's what i'm that's the one i'm hoping for honestly i love marvel so what do you think casual on that one um, i'd I, again i'd love to see it but i i just don't know I don't know if they if they've got the stomach for it at this point, and if it's announced, it's going to be something you know, possibly the way Tron is out in Florida, where it's announced, and you know, come twenty thirty two, we're finally going to get to ride. It, you know? <laughs> oh, that'll be terrible. Uh, he's like, give me <laughs> my people move. That's exterior. all I need. Oh, sorry. What did you the exterior of Tron? before they can open it. It's been going for oh, so long yeah. now that it's looking aged. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the, yeah, I saw those pictures from the amazing bio reconstruct on Twitter. That uh, is pretty terrible. <laughs> Mr. Pro. And shout out to bio reconstruct. Everybody should be following that Twitter account. Bio reconstruct. You really should. Great aerial watch... photos and theme park images. Yeah. If you watch my channel, then you know. Any Epic Universe update is always from BioReconstruct, so you should definitely follow him on Twitter. And, and anything Bio else, he's a you can send your uh, money to uh, the Cash App account for that park place anytime you're ready for that shout-out. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that's hilarious. So, Pro, what do you want? What What is, I guess, your wish list? And you can oh, what obviously see this from Disneyland and oh, Disney World. Well, that's a different question. What yeah. do I want? Yes. Um, within the realm so, of possibility, or or just uh, if I if the sky is the limit and I get to be the uh, realistically, like realistically, what do you want at Disneyland or Disney World? Hmm. Really, no, like that's not, that's not a question that I have considered very often. So let me think about what do I <laughs> want? Because um, Casual wants his people mover. <laughs> I want my Avengers now okay i will tell you what i what i would love to see let's start with walt disney world all right so at walt disney world because we've been talking about disneyland so we'll we'll flop from coast to coast and then i'll come back um there's been some talk about in Adventureland, uh in the magic kingdom there's an area south of the pirates of the caribbean um show building that could be used for a huge e-ticket and more attraction. And then also that could potentially be connected to a secondary gate that would be accessible to a high-end luxury hotel, something nicer than anything that exists currently, something nicer than the Grand Floridian. Mm -hmm. And on the hotel side, that's fine, but I would really love to see some sort of uh, new mountain uh, rise up in Magic Kingdom 
in that part of Adventureland. I'd love to see a new train station that connects to that part of Adventureland. I'd like to see guests go under the current bridge there that's uh, backstage infrastructure. And then if that mountain were to look like some sort of uh, ancient South American ruins, something uh, along those lines, or perhaps it could be something related to the Jungle Book. Um, I think that you could have a lot of fun. And I'd really like to see a roller coaster in the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World that inverts guests. They have the, they've got one ride with a rock and roller coaster that sends guests upside down. But I think that you need more. And I think that a lot of times we forget about uh, teenagers and young adults with the Magic Kingdom. We, we consider that it's a, a place for children of all ages. But, you know, some of those children of all ages are 18 and 22 and 15. And they want some thrills. And uh, Space Mountain and Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, is, as much fun as they are, they, they don't compare with some of those giga coasters out there. I don't think that I want a giga coaster in the Magic Kingdom, but uh, mm -hmm. I could go with something that uh, gives some uh, nausea to the rest of us who are not that age. Um, over at Disneyland, I would love to see, uh, well, I would just love to see uh, California Adventure. Uh, I would like to see an expansion out near uh, Pixar Pier. I would like to see uh, perhaps going over some of the uh, infrastructure there and into the parking lots. And I would like to see, you know, it's hard to say which, which thing they would go with because I'm a little bit biased because I, I sort of know which IPs they want to go with. But I will say, well, let me just drop this. So I think that we're going to get some Encanto news uh, Ooh, regarding nice. the parks. For the treehouse? Well, well, we'll see. But that, uh, that's <laughs> what we do. Um, but, you know, I would love to see something Moana-related over in, in California. And part of that is because if you look at the Disney Plus statistics, you know, for years, Frozen was considered to be the premier girls' uh, intellectual property for Disney. I mean, Frozen was everywhere. But in reality, and, and Tangled as well, Tangled was really good, but in reality, Moana is the movie that has, I mean, it was in the top 10 two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it was in Nielsen's top 10 again mm. for streaming minutes on, uh, mm. on movies. And so, and that's not just Disney plus that's all of the streaming services. That movie came out in 2016. And so Disney really struck gold with Moana. And I'll be honest, I cannot believe that they haven't announced the sequel yet because it is coming. And I'm just waiting for them to announce the sequel to Moana whenever that should occur. I particularly loved Moana. I saw it multiple times. Oh, not in theaters, but on uh, on Disney Plus. Love that thing because I love the water. And she's a great singer, so I love a sequel. Sequel as well, um, or even like a nice Moana boat ride in California Adventure. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised, oh, well, Pro. I, I really thought for Disneyland you were going to be really rooting for a Galactic Star Cruiser West. <laughs> Oh, well, goodness. Uh, so, so I don't know if you guys have been following this on that park place. There's my plug. Um, but uh, <laughs> the Star Cruiser allegedly had its first days of operation under capacity in late August. And it uh, is doing so again this September, it looks like, and could do so on multiple occasions. When you, when you think about that uh, particular experience, only having 100 rooms, uh, it's amazing well, I mean, it's not amazing to, to people who have looked at this, but it's amazing that Disney has not yet found a way to entice at least 100 families uh, to partake in it per voyage. It's, it's really, I mean, you got to consider how many rooms are at some of these other hotels. And mm -hmm. most of those other hotels are running near capacity. Here you have this Star Wars thing that's been out for six months. It's supposed to revolutionize the industry. I'm sure it will win awards at uh, different uh, theme park conventions, but at the same time, they cannot fill it. We're only six months out. And this is what, this is what we were worried about. Uh, I and other analysts who looked at it said, it's going to do fine. March, April, May, June, July, August. And, and actually we were wrong there. It, it didn't get all the way through August before it fell under capacity. Mm. But these downtimes, these downtimes are really the sticky points here. We've got September and October, and then it'll get a boost in November, December. But then, my gosh, look at January. After New Year's, January falls off a cliff in terms of attendance. 
And it's going to stay that way, except for some minor blips like Valentine's Day, President's Day. But I mean, it's going to be a long haul trying to get that thing filled. Now, real quick, I don't want to go too long, but let me say this too. Mm -hmm. In terms of what we're going to get at D23, um, mm -hmm. even six months ago, I was hearing very pessimistic outlooks as to capital expenditures and what Disney was willing to do with the parks. However, the uh, level of success they've had with park revenues and, and large part that's been driven by Walt Disney World because they haven't been able to, to generate the same levels of revenues at the other parks yet for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the parks in China, we'll just leave that on the table for now because, it, I mean, that's horrendous. What's the situation they have there? But we'll leave that be. Um, but the, the different ways that they have monetized what previously was free at uh, Walt Disney World has really generated a lot of revenue. And so far, it has not created the backlash that you might have expected. Now, all of that would, would tend to mean that we're going to see a real increase in expenditures. And I think that's true. And I think we might get a very pleasant surprise at this D23. However, I want to caution everybody that some of those things that may be announced they could be pushed off because what we're seeing right now, especially with the way that Russia is cutting off the energy exports to Europe, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uncertainty in geopolitics that Disney has no control over. And we're already beginning to see international uh, uh, travel to Walt Disney World really crater. And so we've gone from early August and all of the rest of summer, every week prior, uh, Magic Kingdom and every other park at Walt Disney World was absolutely rocking. I mean, they were hot. They were, they were filled, especially with guests from the United Kingdom. And what's happening now is that as the international guests are slowing way, way down, you got to remember they wanted to come bring their children because we're just out of this pandemic. We're just out of lockdowns. They want to get their child to see the castle, to get that experience they had as children before it's too late or before there's new lockdowns or whatever. So there's, there's been this mad rush and Disney has been very confident that they can keep that going. But what we're seeing in the last couple of weeks is that when the international guests dry up, the attendance drops way, way down. I'll give you one quick figure. Then I'll, I'll in my, uh, my discussion on this point, but in the last two weeks, the average wait time for a magic kingdom attraction has been mm. approximately 15 minutes. And Ooh. that is uh, right. And so when we say 15 minutes, what we're really saying is that most of those rides are walk on. Mm. That's right. Because only the big rides are pulling enough to, to raise that to 15. And so, Disney's going to have to get a hold of that. And if Russia continues to uh, be aggressive towards Europe, and if the price globally for energy rises dramatically as it could, you're going to see far less people making that trip across the pond. And that could be a real concern. And that could cause some of these big announcements, let's say, uh, to also be uh, long in waiting. Yeah, and with lower attendance, not only do you have fewer people, you know, fewer tickets, you also have those shorter lines, which means no real reason to purchase Genie Plus or individual Lightning Lanes. That's so exactly that right. revenue starts to dry mm -hmm. up as well. Yeah. So that... quick statistic on the Genie Plus thing. So in the discussion that. Uh, Josh DeMauro and was it McCarthy? I think she was there mm -hmm. as well. But when they, they had a conversation today at a, a major conference, it was the Bank of America Securities Media Communications Entertainment Conference. Um, they cited that of the people who have purchased Genie Plus and then returned to the parks, 70% have purchased Genie Plus again. Now, they presented that in a positive light, but I really don't think that that is positive. And I've, I've been thinking about it just a little bit, but I don't see how if you only get 70%, that means that 30% of the people who purchased it were able to identify that it provided them with not enough uh, <laughs> benefit to warrant a repurchase. So is a 30% failure rate for, for delivering on what the guest expected? Is that positive? I just don't. 
I know it's greater mm-hmm. than 50%, but is that really how we're measuring that? Yeah, and, and also, it, like, it depends on, like, who the percentage buys Genie Plus in the first place. And then, so, like, if only, like, I don't know, half the people buy it, then only 70% return again. And then if they keep dwindling, then soon that number may be much lower than 70%, maybe under 50%, like you may like you said, you're saying. Well, you got to think that in the off seasons, it's, it's practically worthless. And mm. when, when it's crowded, you could get uh, a benefit from having it, but you also have to have the knowledge of how to do so. So your average person may take it and use it in a, in a way that does not reap the benefits that they could have if they were well-versed in all of Disney. We've run, uh, we've run, I think, three, three different analysis of it um, at three different points. And, and we found that if you know what you're doing, if you have been to the Disney parks, either Disneyland or Walt Disney World, um, then you're probably not going to need Genie Plus. There mm-hmm. are a few exceptions. And of course, on those individual lightning lane passes where you can, let's say, purchase to uh, avoid Rise of the Resistance lines, mm-hmm. I mean, that just comes down to... Are you willing to wait two hours or for your, your party of four, can you afford $60? And if you can afford the $60, skip it. And sometimes not even that. I was, I was looking at uh, the Disneyland app. Was it yesterday or the day before? You know, of course, here in California, it's been very hot. But at one time, a lot of the times, actually, during these hot days, um, there are people in the parks because Hon- it was actually on the day Haunted Mansion Holiday opened, so September 1st. Haunted Mansion Holiday was two hours. Rise of the Resistance was 30 minutes. So you wouldn't even need to, b- need to buy the individual light and laying then. It was 30 minutes, like in the middle of the afternoon. And then sure. it was like 50 minutes for the whole, uh, a different point in that same weekend. While again, Monster Guardians of the Galaxy and uh, Haunted Mansion Holiday, the two holiday overlays, were both uh, hovering two hours the whole weekend. Rise of the Resistance was under an hour for most of it, when I was checking at least, which would totally invalidate uh spending $20 on it, especially from when I've waited in the line. If it says 60 minutes, 30 of those minutes are in the line, but then the other 30 is like in the, you know, the, the pre-shows and you're in the going through the shuttle because I've timed it and about the halfway point on multiple times of that wait time, I've gotten to the shuttle. In my opinion, the ride kind of starts when, I, you know, when I'm in the shuttle. Like the wait, I don't look at the wait time anymore then. So I feel like that wait time may be even over exaggerated, which further eliminates well, if you, again if you that. Include that wait time, if you include that wait time, it provides incentive to people who don't know that, like you do. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like all it takes is if they do, if it's low enough and they figure that out, they're like, wait a second. Hmm. Next time when it's higher, then I feel like I can wait again. And then further de de incentivizes them pushing $20 again. Which is very interesting. Very interesting. I don't know about Rise in Walt Disney World, though. How is, is that one more crowded or higher wait times? <laughs> well, Hollywood Studios is, is uh, quite the mess. Hollywood Studios is different than any of the other parks at Walt Disney World. It was not originally designed to be the type of theme park that it is. Um, as much as I like Disneyland, it, didn't, it did not do Hollywood Studios any favors that... Uh, that Walt Disney World was forced to take the Disneyland version of Galaxy's Edge and shoehorn it into a location that it doesn't really belong. And mm-hmm. so so Hollywood Studios has been in need of more attractions and higher capacity. So when it comes to that ride, being in Hollywood Studios and having uh, very long wait times, well, so do almost all the other rides there. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's like nice. only like seven of them or so, right? I forget the official number, but they tend to be very big rides that people want to be on. And so the problem yeah. with that, that park is that there aren't enough of those little D ticket attractions that pull people mm-hmm. in the seat C ticket attractions that have high capacity and can keep people busy while they're waiting for their next uh, lightning lane to pop up. Yeah, that's a, uh, hmm. So it's almost like an artificially inflated wait time simply because there's not not much else to do. Well, if there's anything that 
if there's anything that Disney needs to do greatly with Walt Disney World, other than what we talked about at Magic Kingdom, it is increase the capacity. And that's probably true for Disneyland as well. It's much harder to do. But um, right now, their real constraint is capacity. They need to have ways to get more guests into the park because the only other option they have for revenue growth is to increase costs. What they've done is held the ticket prices relatively the same in comparison to pre-pandemic, but that's been at the cost of adding all levels of, of monetization on things that were previously free and really made you feel that you were receiving excellent service and that Disney magic that they used to, they used to preach. And so whether it's at Hollywood studios, whether it's at magic kingdom, whether it's at Disneyland or California adventure, they're going to have to find ways to increase capacity because we have more people, not less. And those people want to have their Disney vacations too. And people want to go on multiple Disney vacations during their lifetimes. They don't want to do just one big trip. So that is, I mean, that's a, a blessing and a curse, right? But you're going to, you're going to have to create more space for more people and, and keep those turn styles turning. <laughs> Very interesting. Woo-hoo. What do you think about all that casual? Would do you think if they announce big projects, will they go through? Will they be installed uh, due to declining international attendance? Do you think they should? Uh, Disney should help out their annual pass for Magic Key holders to fill in the gaps for any decline in annual attendance or international attendance. Yeah, I, there, there's talk that the Magic Keys may be coming back, that they, they may ha- start new sales again. Um, we've been kind of noticing, I don't know if it's due to the heat or, or what, or just the international tourism dropping off, but we've been noticing that the parks are getting rather light as far as attendance goes, and it's starting to show up basically at, at all parks. We, I was even noticing over the weekend Knott's Berry Farm here in Southern California was starting to kind of show a little bit of a, a lighter attendance already. So if that keeps up, then the projects, yeah, they'll, they'll start getting spaced out or just kind of, you know, fade off into the distance, you know, and, and just never spoken of again, kind of the way the that wonderful Mary Poppins ride we were supposed to get for Epcot happened. And, you know, that, that one still just bothers me because after all these years, there's still no Mary Poppins ride anywhere in the world. That that's, that's a travesty to me. That's actually insane. Now I think about it. Yeah. So, um, I think, I think it will pop up on the horizon. Oh, you think so? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, they went to great, effort to secure that they had to go through third parties to acquire additional rights to be able to develop and and put that in and so they still have that and i don't think they would want to lose it i don't know what the expiration is um but they're probably going to want to put that in in the next five years ish let me Mm -hmm. also say too that when we're talking about all these other theme parks that are experiencing some downturns you know when we're talking about the big theme parks they've been rather resilient in the post-pandemic if we want to call it that world uh, they've been able to weather the inflationary situation we have inside the economy. Some of the, the small regional parks, however, have not been so lucky and have had really rough times. And part of what I'm concerned about is that if energy costs rise once again, um, if the world goes into a semi-war kind of situation, I really worry that some of the big theme parks like the Disney's and the Universal Studios, I worry that they may also see a downturn in attendance as families begin to uh, hold on to their the, the money that they have. And that may be a societal trend where we're seeing people looking at inflation, looking at uncertainty and saying, you know, after this pandemic, we had all of this money that was sent to us by the government, but that, that may be dry and we're going to be more uh, cautious with our spending now. Hmm. That's a good point. Right. Yeah, I, I, I was talking um, with um, Orange Grove and Vash the other day, how if Disney keeps nickel and diming people, you know, because they're not raising the ticket price, so they're mm-hmm. having those other avenues where they have to squeeze some money out of the guests to get the spend up, how many of those people take the same number of Disney vacations that they would? 
You know, so a family that would go every year, or every two years may now stretch it out to once every five years. And what does that do to, to their revenue stream? But also the long term, if you don't have kids making those memories and getting that Disney fix, if you will, that affection toward the parks and the Disney brand, are they going to be willing when they're older to be spending the money to come back if they don't have that same connection? Oh, that's a really good point and one I had not yet considered. Mm hmm. That nostalgia factor. Yeah, you know, right. you see that you see the uh, all the time people uh, have bring their ch children and babies and toddlers to Disney and then then. Y'all see grandmas at Disney's that say, oh, I went back here in 1963, and it was great. Those are the <laughs> Yeah. The grandmas. I'm... Right. That's right. They'll spend big money on those grandbabies. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, that, that to me is the, the big question, you know, looking five, ten years down the road, if Disney keeps keeps up at this pace of monetizing every every little aspect of the parks, I, I think we're going to start to see some of that happening, that, that attrition for the, like you said, the nostalgia. It, it's, it's just not going to be there in the next generation. And it's going to be that much harder for Disney to, to pull in families again. Mm -mm. Very interesting. We'll have to we'll definitely have to see it all plays out over the next few years. And I'll be an old man. I'll be 30. <laughs> Four years. <laughs> well, my guess it was so great to have all of you, both of you, on for this awesome discussion. Theme park casual. Always nice to have you on the channel. This is, like I said, your third time, and hopefully, you get to meet up at Knott's Scary Farm next month. Um, and Man, I've been looking for your Knots videos. I hope you post a lot more on your channel. <laughs> Where can people find you and watch everything about Knots? Well, you can find me on YouTube. I am Theme Park Casual. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Theme Park Casual. And while you're there, don't forget to check out my merch store. i got some really cool merch. That's right. He's the most casual theme park guy there is. And then WDW Pro. Where can everyone reach your whole team's fabulous articles and and find you on social media well you can find wdw pro at thatparkplace.com thatparkplace.com the place where all the news is fun and the fun is the news you can find us on twitter at thatparkplace1 even though we own that park place we chose to go with the one that says one because of human error but anyway, we, uh, we also have uh, uh, all kinds of articles on everything Disney, all kinds of stuff on uh, streaming, Star Wars, Marvel, and we'll be very excited to be covering potentially some Indiana Jones news this weekend. Interesting. Very stay tuned for that. Uh, and of course, he's not just a pro on Walt Disney World, but a pro on everything Disney has to offer. That parkplace.com not Link those park places <laughs> parkplaces.com it's that park place <laughs> that's right and theme park casual all both the links will be in the comments below thank you so much for joining it was awesome to have you on i know you're a super busy guy um i know i talked about having you on like a about like a month ago so at least two months ago so so glad you're able to come on thank you for making some time for me same with you mr casual i know you're busy going to not so thank you for <laughs> making some time to pop in to the theme park wizard and if you like this video press that thumbs up and subscribe for more theme park updates oh boom